Changemakers, welcome back to Cause Doc Radio. I'm Allie Murphy with Engage for Good. You're in for a fun, insightful, and inspiring podcast today. But let's start with the not so inspiring. We live in a world where excess and consumption have never been higher, yet millions of people find themselves in critical need every day. Good360, one of Engage for Good sponsors, is the global leader in product philanthropy and works with some of the world's largest brands to connect critically needed goods with over 100,000 nonprofits that help people in need throughout the U.S. and around the world. In just a moment, I'll be joined by Sherry Rudolph, Good360's Chief Development Officer and CMO, to explore the lessons they've learned, Sherry's advice for nonprofits and companies alike, and ways to accurately identify and support community needs. You'll also learn about ways companies can get involved even if they don't have a product, how to mitigate a second disaster, and the importance of being outcome-focused instead of impact-focused. And with that, let's get started. Hi, Sherry, and welcome to Cost Talk Radio. Thanks, Allie. Really appreciate you having us on. Would you start us off by giving us a brief overview of Good360? Who are you and what exactly do you do? Sure, I would be happy to. So in a nutshell, Good360's mission is to close the need gap and open opportunity for all. But what that really means is that um, as the global leader in what we call product philanthropy or in-kind giving and purposeful giving, we work with companies of all types um, that have product that they want to donate. And then we match up those product donations with vetted nonprofits around the United States and sometimes internationally So those nonprofits can serve people in need in their own communities. So we will work with our partners to distribute almost anything you can think of from clothing and footwear to personal care items, to household goods, to building materials, to even automotive parts and supplies. Um, So that's really our focus is making sure that we're getting the right goods to the right people at the right time. And in doing so, we're we're really helping mitigate and eliminate waste. Okay, so you're getting at one of the things that I wanted to ask next. I want to get into some of who your partners are and some stories. But first, I'm curious about the these in-kind donations because you've said everything from building materials to clothing. Is this typically excess that companies have? Is it like, where does it come from on the company side? Yeah, that's a great question. And it does come from a few different areas. So it might be excess. Um, we're still not, you know, 100% perfect at forecasting consumer tastes and trends. And so sometimes we have things that are left over in the supply chain. Uh, Sometimes it may be something as simple as maybe a packaging error, right? There might be a misprint on the packaging, but the product is still fantastic. We once had a retailer donate over 70 truckloads, like semi-trailer fulls of pillows that were fantastic, but they just had a printing mistake on the packaging. So that's sometimes how we get goods. And then we also get goods through what's called the reverse logistics chain. And that's kind of a fancy way of talking about consumer returns. And Mm -hmm. that has grown a lot over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, particularly with the rise of e-commerce and people buying more things online. Um, And I don't know about you, but if I want to get a pair of shoes or something, I might get two different sizes or two different colors and figure out what I want to keep. And then I return the other one. So companies now are building these really uh, strategic sense of capabilities around their reverse logistics. And they're finding that that some of the product is very suitable for donation. Uh, So it's brand new. It might not even be out of the package. Or if it is out of the package, it hasn't been used. So that's another way in which we get goods as well. So they could be excess goods. They could be consumer returns. And they could also be designated goods for a specific purpose. So we do a lot of work in disaster recovery, for example. Right. And and yeah, we'll work with our donor companies to ask for very specific things that communities that have been hit by a natural disaster might need at a specific point in time. So the product can come from a lot of different sources. Let's kind of bring this idea to life. You've talked about the, I think, four, it sounds like, different places that product can come from. Can you give us an example of Good360 at work, maybe a story of a company you've partnered with to distribute goods, and maybe on the flip side of that, a nonprofit or multiple that have received those? Yeah, absolutely. So we work with hundreds of organizations, um, more than 400 different corporate partners, right? We partner with some of the largest retailers and companies in the world. So we, we operate at scale. And if you think about The ecosystem that Good360 manages, we have all of our corporate donors on one side, and that's really the supply of the product. And then we have all of our nonprofit partners on the other side, and that's where the demand for the product arises from. So there's a few different ways. I think it's helpful to understand just kind of how the product gets to where it can do the most good. 
Um, and given the scale that we're at, we haven't talked about this yet, but in 2020, a Good360 distributed over $870 million in goods. And this year in 2021, we're forecasting to distribute over $1 billion in goods. So yeah, so it's significant scale. And we have to do a lot of work to make sure that we're getting goods, like I said, to the right people at the right time, but also in the right configurations. So with a, when a nonprofit requests donated goods from us, they can request them from just a single carton of shampoo or a single carton of clothing to serve a community in need, or they can request much bigger volumes all the way up to full semi truckloads full of goods in different categories, depending on how they serve their communities and what the needs are in those particular communities. Um, So there's a lot of complexity in moving that amount of goods around the country and sometimes internationally to meet people where they're at in their communities and make sure that we're filling those needs. Um, As I said, we work with hundreds of different companies. We work with companies like Amazon and Walmart. The UPS Foundation is a big partner for us in helping with um, shipping support. For example, we work with Nike and Mattel, hundreds of different brands and retailers and companies um, that work with us to when they have either, like I said, excess goods or specific goods to serve a specific community that we can get into the hands of people in need. So one of my favorite stories from actually last year during COVID was um, working with Nike. Nike had developed a specific shoe called the Nike Air Zoom Pulse. Um, And this was a a shoe specifically designed for frontline healthcare workers. So the the, the cushioning in it, the antimicrobial features of it the that was easy to wash and clean right so all of these different features um that made it the perfect shoe for frontline healthcare workers and of course last year and still now our system is under so much strain and so are are the heroes that work on the front lines of the healthcare system and so nike turned to us to help distribute 30,000 pairs of those specialty shoes as well as um, close to 100,000 pairs of compression socks because these folks are obviously on their feet all day as well so that was that's an example of where we have a really specific relationship and we were nike was able to tap into the strength of our network and make sure that we could help them get those goods where they wanted them to go and where they would where they would do the most the most good um, another example actually last year we had um, We work with a lot of companies, like I said, but in 2020, a couple of our most meaningful partnerships that emerged, new partnerships, were actually with other nonprofits, other NGOs. And one of the programs we're really proud of is work that we do with Toys for Tots. So um, the Marine Foundation, Toys for Tots, obviously does a lot of incredible work in the holiday season every year. And they're very well known for the toy drives and the distribution of toys for um, underprivileged kids or kids that find themselves in vulnerable situations during that time of the year. But they didn't have the infrastructure and the operations to be able to distribute toys at other times of the year. So when COVID hit, everything shut down. Schools were shut down. Kids were at home. Toys for Tots turned to us and said, you know, how can we work together to get toys in the hands of kids during this really, really challenging time um, outside the holiday season? So we were able to work with Toys for Tots to distribute over 2 million toys, books, and games for kids in 2020 outside of the holiday season and on top of what they normally do. So really working together, we were able to expand that that impact footprint. I can only imagine the smiles on some of those kids' faces when the toys arrived. It's it's incredible. I mean, we there was a story actually from the work that we did with Toys for Tots this year that I think there was not a dry eye among us when we Aww. heard about how this came about. And it was um, there was a nonprofit doing a door to door distribution, taking toys through this partnership to families at their homes, and just the coincidence of timing, they happened to ring a doorbell on a house where it was a child's birthday. But because of the challenging circumstances presented by COVID and other things coming together and parents without jobs and sources of income, they felt that they weren't going to be able to, they weren't able to have a birthday party, they weren't able to have gifts. And so when this nonprofit arrived with toys from Bid360 and Toys for Tots, um, the timing was just beautiful and perfect. And, and that little boy was able to have a birthday party and actually have gifts um, delivered to him on his actual birthday. Um, and that's the why, right? The, that's a great example of the why we do what we do and how we engage our partners to help us with that. But to your point, there is nothing better 
than the smiles of children who receive toys when it's the, the, the last thing they expect. So your bread and butter, as I'm going to call it, is product philanthropy. What should companies know about this space? A really great way to frame this is to take a little bit of a step back. So when we talk about our mission to close the need gap, I think it's helpful to understand like where that comes from, because this is a bigger societal set of challenges. It's not just a good 360 thing, right? So we're finding ourselves at a point in our kind of human history and in society today where there's a couple of competing dynamics. So one is that there's never been greater need in our society before. And that's just been exacerbated and a really fine point put on it over the last 18 months or so. Um, when you layer in the impacts of a global pandemic, you layer impacts of the increasing frequency and intensity of natural disasters. And we find ourselves with pockets of need that are growing and widening in terms of, of their breadth. On the other side, we've also never been producing more goods than we are now. So there we have is, an excess. We have an excess, exactly. And so this really is not about a supply problem. It's a distribution problem. And so mm-hmm. Good360 and others like us and, and others in our ecosystem, we want to work together to make sure we're connecting those dots to get the goods where they can do the most good. Um, we live, ultimately, we live in a world of plenty, but we still have so many people that are going without. And this is a role that Good360 and our partners can play. So your question about what should companies be thinking about when they want to get involved in product philanthropy or thinking about maybe how it fits into their CSR and ESG um, priorities is to be thinking about like, what do you What do you have in terms of assets or what do you produce or have available? What are your organizational strengths that you can use in order to help close this need gap? So you may have product, which is fantastic. And certain types of product are obviously always in need. Things like diapers, um, other items for babies, certain types of clothing and, and footwear, basic personal care items, et cetera. Um, There's always uh, such a broad variety of need out there. So for a company to be thinking about, like, how can we really help close the need gap? How can we um, leverage the strengths that we have? And if you don't make product, there's still lots of ways to get involved, right? So we work with a lot of partners who maybe don't manufacture or retail any specific kind of product. Maybe they're more in a services business. Um, Maybe they have cash that will help us underwrite the cost of getting the goods to where they need to go. Financial donations are always welcome because of the cost of operating an ecosystem like this. Moving a billion dollars of goods around is yeah, not, I can only is imagine. not free. Right, exactly. No. Um, but you might also, as a company, you might have a great uh, employee base that you can leverage for volunteerism, right? So going and helping do cleanup in a coordinated and strategic way after a, a disaster or working with your local food bank to be able to help serve the community um, in your local area. But you might also have other assets, like maybe you have unused warehouse space. And so for Ah. somebody like Good360 or some of our nonprofit partners that are around the United States, we can use that. If you've got, you know, 10,000 square feet of of warehouse space that's sitting idle and you you can donate that for 30 or 60 or 90 days or some period of time, that can be extremely helpful. Um, to help serve communities' day-to-day needs, and then, and then also with a geographic focus, helping um, communities that have been impacted by disasters. So we really encourage companies to think about, you know, what is it that you do really well? Um, where can you align with what the needs in our society are, and how can you tap into those assets that you already have to do the most good that you can? Um, and on the product philanthropy side specifically, it's, it's you know, it, there's also an economic equation here to think about. There's often tax benefits and it's up to every company to look at, you know, what those might be based on the type of goods that you have to donate. But it's very much worth investigating it and can sometimes be a better economic equation than liquidation, for example. Um, so, yeah, so it's important to look at it from all of those different perspectives and think about how, how doing good aligns with your overall business goals as well. I, lo- I mean, you, of course, your, your bread and butter is product philanthropy. I know you go far beyond that, but I love how you just gave a list of, without counting, probably seven different ways that even if it's not product philanthropy or in-kind donations, there's so many other ways that companies can use their resources, their people, their assets, their skills to close this needs gap. 
So on the flip side of that, we've talked about companies. What should nonprofits know about product philanthropy? Or maybe you're going to go more broad again. Yeah. So on the other side, the nonprofit side... um, so again, we're we're facing sort of a, a distribution problem, not a supply problem. We still have so many people going without, and these are being, we're we're sort of tackling um, massive societal issues, right? That that the world is kind of looking to the NGO space to to fill to step in and bridge the gap to to help solve these challenges, and we have limited resources to do that. So if you're looking, if you're a nonprofit and you're trying to figure out either, you know, how do I grow my in-kind giving program or how do I even just get started? I think there's a few things to think about. One is that if you're going out and buying goods on just the open market through retail or whatever it might be, there could be a big opportunity for you to, for you to save a tremendous amount of funds and then by sourcing donated goods and then reallocating the money that you save to your programs and services. Um, so that's an important way to, to, to look at it, right? Donation programs, in-kind donation programs can really help you stretch your program dollars even further. I would also say that um, what one of the things that we've really learned uh, in spades is that it's so important to be needs-based and to plan your programs around the needs that exist. And that sounds like common sense, but it, it doesn't always play out that way. So I think advice for nonprofits is also understand what your community truly needs so that you're only sourcing what can be used and what will make the most impact um, in that community. And then, of course, you know, by doing that, you're you're mitigating the risk of having waste if you get donated right. goods that you truly can't use. Um, for nonprofits who want to who want to start looking at this or maybe grow where they are, say, you know, start small and easy. It's really easy with with Good360 and probably even with some of the partners that companies or I'm sorry, that nonprofits have in their local communities to start really small with small kind of targeted requests for things that you know you can need, maybe for a specific program or for a specific initiative. Um, and then over time, if this is something that you want to build more and scale, then measured growth is really the way to go. And that requires some planning, right? Because you're going to need more resources as you continue to grow right. and as you look to distribute more goods. Um, you'll need maybe more volunteers or staff to receive the goods, to sort the goods, to configure them in a way in which they can be distributed to your community members. You might need more warehouse space. You might need some equipment like a forklift or a pallet jack or something along those lines. So there's a lot of things to consider moving into the space and thinking about how you can best serve your community. Um, but thankfully, there's a really strong ecosystem with corporate donors and, and others that are um, doing this every single day and trying to make it as easy as possible to get the donated goods where they can do the most good. As you already know, a good portion of our listeners work at companies, and you've talked about what they should know in this space or more broadly, but how have you specifically partnered with businesses in the past to help them reach their ESG goals? Great question. I think there's a couple of things that that bubble to the top here. So when you think about what we're doing, we're taking maybe it's excess goods, like I mentioned, or maybe specifically defined goods to serve a specific cause or um, target population. So the, the first big thing when you think about ESG, the E part, the environmental part, the big, the, one of the big wins here for, for us, for our partners, for the planet, is that we're helping mitigate waste. And so we can extend the useful life of goods that would otherwise maybe end up in landfills or maybe otherwise be destroyed. So we can do things as basic as work with our partners to measure the poundage or the tonnage of goods that are being diverted from landfill. And that becomes a really specific measure that companies can use as a as a measuring stick on how well they're doing and what progress they're making sort of quarter over quarter or year over year. Um, so that's a big one for us is sort of this, you know, let's make the planet a better place to live. Let's make sure that we're not wasting these perfectly good items that are out there and, and filling landfills with them. Um, and the other piece, the S, the, the, the social piece of it, Um, that's the other part that is a little bit trickier sometimes to get to, but there is so much opportunity here to make an impact on specific causes and populations and be able to measure not just maybe lives impacted or how many items are being distributed to those target populations, but what we're trying to move towards is understanding how do we get more to specific outcomes, not just the impact, but what are the actual outcomes? And so as companies are looking to to formalize their their ESG 
investments and what they're measuring and how they're measuring. I think those things are going to be more important for all of us. And we're going to have to work together to come up with solutions that, that get there. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now, but I'm also a big fan of lessons learned. So what's something that you've tried that didn't work? And what did you learn from that experience? That is such an excellent question. Um, and of course, <laughs> we would like to say that we everything we've tried has been great, but you're right. Everything is iterative and we're on sort of a constant um, pursuit for improvement. And uh, one of the things that I can highlight that I think is a great lesson for all of us is in our disaster recovery work. So there's a couple of... When I joined Good360 almost six years ago, there were a couple of industry statistics that just blew me away. And one of those was that at a, in, in a time of a natural disaster, about 60% or almost two-thirds of goods that are donated go to waste. They end up in landfills or they otherwise end up going to waste, right? And we've probably all seen those photos where... Uh, there's just bags of clothing on the side of a runway in Haiti after an earthquake, or somebody sends roller skates and prom dresses to an area after a natural disaster. And I'm not well intentioned, but yes. And that's the thing. It's, it is always well intentioned, but without sort of a connection to what's really needed on the ground then those, well in those good intentions can turn into what we call the second disaster. Um, and you end up sending goods into areas and you clog up supply chains, you divert volunteers from the life-saving and life-preserving activities that they're doing. And now they have to figure out what to do with all of this stuff that nobody can use and, and nobody asked for in the first place. Um, so we wanted to be part of the solution to that. And we we tried a, we tried a few things like working with groups in disaster and where we ended up moving to was um, a core pillar of what we do is around pre-positioning. So we realized pretty quickly that when a disaster event happens, it's really hard to move stuff into an area at that point because infrastructure is compromised. Everybody else is trying to do stuff. It's hard to get access to shipping lanes, et cetera. Um, so we started, and this is, you know, something that a lot of our partners work with us to do. We started pre-positioning things that we know are going to be needed. It's just a matter of kind of when and where in strategic locations that are close to disaster vulnerable regions, um, but not to too vulnerable themselves. So for example, we do some pre-positioning in um, Southern Alabama, and that's been really helpful for serving the Florida panhandle. Um, when we've had hurricane activity in those areas. And it may be things like um, disaster kits for families that have had to leave their, their homes with nothing more than the clothes on their back. And so maybe it's a personal care kit with just toothpaste and shampoo and deodorant and those basic things, socks and underwear, those kinds of things. Um, but it can also be pre-positioning things like PPE, masks and rubber boots and jumpsuits and things for the mucking and gutting that is going to have to start happening within a couple of weeks of, of a flooding event or a hurricane, for example. Um, so that's a big lesson for us that I, I think we've, we're really proud of. We've been able to sort of help move the needle a little bit. We're doing a bit of research right now. And we think we've actually within um, not just the work that we do, but all of our partners and everybody in this disaster recovery ecosystem, we've actually been able to change that 60% number. Um, we're gathering research right now, but early indicators point that, that it's a lot lower, that we're making an impact on that waste, which is fantastic. Well, you've shared so many nuggets of wisdom, and I'm, I'm so excited to come back and listen to this again in the future, but we're coming to the end of our time. And one of my favorite questions to ask people is, what's your favorite thing about working at Good360? Oh my gosh, that's so easy. It is definitely, <laughs> it is definitely our team. We have just a, an incredible team of professionals. We're about 57 people right now. So we're not very big in terms of the actual numbers, but we're so proud of the impact that we have. Um, everybody on the team is incredibly committed and passionate to our mission and wanting to make the world a better place and in whatever small or big way that we can do that together. Um, so yeah, that's, 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 that's an easy one. I feel like that was such a softball question. That's so it's, it's such an easy one to answer. It's definitely our team. It's just an incredible collection of individuals. It's a question I love asking because everybody's face lights up when you ask it and they go, Ooh, I've got an answer for this. Right. Is, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And if people we've kind of, done, well, we've done more than scratch the surface, but if people want to learn more about Good360, the work that you do, who you partner with, maybe how they can get involved, where can they do that online? 
Yeah. Well, just come to our website at get360.org. If you're a company interested in donating goods, um, you'll see that there's an easy way to get in touch with our corporate partnership specialist who can walk you through what the opportunities are and how easy we can make product the whole product donation process. If you're a nonprofit who's interested in getting product to serve your local community, you can register with Good360 and become a vetted member of our nonprofit network. There is no cost to become a member of our network. Um, the vetting part is really important. Compliance is very important to us to make sure the goods are going where we intend them and they're being used in the way in which um, that we intend and also that the donor intends. And then finally, if you're an individual and you're just interested in learning a little bit more, perhaps supporting what we do, you can go to good360.org and we're always happy to welcome cash donations. Um, the operating, our operating model has created a lot of leverage. So for every $1 that we receive in funds, we can distribute at least $10 in needed goods. So there's a significant amount of efficiency and leverage there. So no matter who you are, there's always there's uh, there's definitely a way to get involved, and there's something that that uh, that you can learn about Good Three Hundred and Sixty. There's a corporation, a nonprofit, or just an individual who wants to help make the world a better place. Well, Sherry, thank you so much for joining me today on the show. It was a pleasure to chat with you, and thanks for sharing your insights with our community. Thank you so much, Allie. Appreciate you having us on Cause Talk Radio. Cause Talk Radio is a production of Engage for Good in partnership with True Story FM. Engineering by Pete Wright. Music this week by Zach Sorgan and Rex Banner. If your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, we hope you'll consider doing just that for our show. But the best thing you can do to support Cause Talk Radio is to simply share the show with a friend or colleague. Thank you for listening. <laughs>